and we're recording this session. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning from Hong Kong, Chicago, and Houston. And we have uh, Rainer in um, KL who's trying to join us in. Um, what we are going to talk about today is the scams and in international sourcing that have happening during these COVID times, especially in the sourcing of PPEs. Uh, and I have I'm very pleased to have some of the industry experts here with us uh, who each of them I respect a lot and I think bring a lot of value uh, to, the, uh, to the supply chain of PPEs. Uh, they've all worked and uh, sold and bought millions of PPEs and have a lot of experience uh, with what goes right and what goes wrong. So it's going to be a very interesting discussion today. Um, I have, first of all, I have Doug, who is the CEO of PPE Advantage. Doug has spent about 30 years uh, in Asia. He's lived in, uh, uh, in uh, different uh, countries in Asia. He's worked for companies uh, like Planet Hollywood, and he's uh, done a lot of sourcing for companies like Container Store, Cisco, Lowe's, Ace Hardware, <coughs> Nordstrom's, and others. And since last year, he's been very active in the PPE space, uh, especially gloves and wipes. Uh, he's also been a good advocate, educating people in the space uh, of PPEs about what are the challenges uh, in the PPE sourcing world and how to avoid these challenges. So he's a great, uh, it's great to have you here, Doug. Uh, and we'll of course discuss a lot more soon. Then we have Paul. Uh, Paul and I are ex-colleagues from Intertech, good friends and uh, colleagues. But Paul uh, is a serial entrepreneur too, now based in Houston, originally from Guangzhou. He started EverPP. EverPP uh, now has manufacturing facilities for masks and he's got his own warehouses, uh, warehouse facilities in Houston. Uh, Paul has been very active uh, in the mask space. He uh, dwindled in the glove space, but he pulled out, but he is super active uh, with 3M, with Honeywell, as well as his own manufacturing units. And because he comes from the compliance and the testing inspection background, he also adds a lot of value in terms of how to monitor, how to, um, how to check the goods. Uh, Rainer, our third panelist, is going to join in. He was with us while we were practicing early on. His internet was having some issues, so hopefully he will join in soon. But he is uh, an independent non-executive director of Top Glove. Top Glove is world's largest glove manufacturing company. Um, and he is in charge of the risk management committee at uh, at Top Glove. So he's the perfect guy to talk about risk mitigation from a point of view as a buyer as well as a seller. And he was, used to be, Rainer used to be the CEO of Siemens, uh, Siemens Malaysia. Um, he's been in Malaysia for the last 23 years, uh, very well connected and very well respected in the industry. So with that, we'll jump into the panel um, and I am really, really hoping that we can get um, uh, we can get Rainer to join in really quick. The main topic that we're going to be discussing about uh, today, or we're going to talk about, is why are there so many scams in this business? But before that jump, I jump in there. For those who don't know me, I should introduce myself too. I did. I forgot to mention myself. I introduced myself. So I've been in the sourcing industry um, and quite some time. I do. I may look young, but I've still still been in the sourcing industry for 21 years. Uh, worked in India, in uh, Taiwan, in China, Hong Kong, New York, Europe, uh, and back in Hong Kong. Um, and I worked with uh, large brands, small brands. I worked on sourcing platforms, sourcing trade shows, uh, and, and much more. Since last year, I started, uh, actually end of 2019, I started Buy Hive with my co-founders with the objective of solving the main issues of the sourcing industry, not knowing we're gonna be hit by COVID. Uh, and then we had to jump into sourcing uh, COVID supplies because of the demand. And we've ourselves experienced some good things, some bad things, and learned a lot. 
uh, but we've made a profitable business to start with, and we're launching new solutions for the sourcing industry, not just the PPE supplies, but other products also. So uh, we're really excited to be part of this industry and hopefully we'll continue working with people like yourselves to provide solutions that will help you source better. Uh, we have uh, Doug and Paul, I have some data here and some pictures. Why don't I ask you guys to jump in and talk about your experience and why do you think these scams are happening and your observations, uh, both from a mass perspective as well as glove perspective and overall industry perspective. Doug? You're, you're on mute, Doug. Sorry, sorry. No problem. Happy to start. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Um, so, I, you know, I've done some videos on this before and, and uh, a lot of people know my feelings on where uh, the opportunity came for gloves to become so nefarious. And my, my um, feeling is, is that whenever you have uh, greed and need together, uh, you're going to find this opportunity for nefarious people and criminals and organized crime to get in the middle of that. So we not only have the greed of uh, middlemen and, and lots of uh, broker chains and things like that, but we also have on the ground in countries of origin, we also have organized criminals. There's lots of that both in Viet in all, in all the countries, Vietnam, China, Malaysia, Thailand, all the nitro and, and glove producing countries um, all have their own base of organized crime. Um, and then you have the regular organized crime, be it Russia or even the U.S. And I've, um, I, I've deduced <laughs> that part of the reason why there's so much organized crime involved in gloves right now is because it's just so easy. Uh, their regular business, their core business of drugs and prostitution and human trafficking have all been um, curtailed during COVID. Uh, people can't travel around as much. People's uh, movements are restricted. So those type of industries that made them the most money are, are not bringing in the type of money that they were before. And so they have to look to other places to get it. And the beginning of COVID, uh, of course, in the U.S., uh, the most obvious scams were going on with three, three unmasked. And I'm sure Paul can speak to that. But quickly, that was able to be uh, well, not quickly, but it was able to be curtailed pretty quick because it was all focused on one brand that could kind of be um, controlled and um, message could be sent out by the company pretty easily. With Nitro Gloves, there's just so many players in it uh, and there's so much nefarious underbelly of the whole marketplace. It's just such a dirty business, to be honest with you. It's just been a, just a melting pot for uh, scams of all sorts of nature. Like most of it is bank fraud with LCs and escrows. A lot of it is, uh, is false goods and counterfeits. Um, a lot of repackers using used goods. Um, just an, an enormous amount of people losing their money. It's a dangerous business. I, I tell people all the time, if you don't need to be in nitrile or you don't know what you're doing, don't be in it. It's really freaking dangerous. That's all, let's, let's can turn it over to Paul at this point. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Doc. Uh, the very good uh, explanation about the, the organized crimes uh, in the PPEs. Uh, from, I would like to um, explain this uh, in a little bit uh, from demand and the supply, you know, uh, what caused this. I, th I think, uh, as Doc just mentioned, at the beginning, all these crimes happened in the 3M mask. Because uh, that, that, that was the first demand in search. Uh, and then uh, now all the you know, organized crimes happen only in the uh, gloves industry and not happening to any other PPEs because uh, uh, it's all, uh, all the other PPEs are already oversupplied. So there is no demand. The demand is a lot of smaller than the sm supply on the US uh, underground goods and also the production orders. I, I think that, that that's the main reason uh, when this uh, pandemic starts, people, uh, you know, everybody will try to jump into that because uh, there's so much demand that there, there are less supply. 
So uh, that's uh, a lot of things that organized the crimes happened. But uh, more than that, I think in some uh, severe, ca severe cases, that's organized crime. But for most of the other cases, it's just uh, the, you know, lost in translation, lost in communications. You know, there are a lot of uh, uh, people involved, you know, so many, so many layers from the supplier to the end user. Uh, you have not like the traditional business, right? When you make something, you have a um, uh, manufacturer and then you have a exporter, you have importer, you have the distributor, you have the end user, that's it. But in this, you have uh, so many broker A, broker B, broker C. You thought you were talking to a buyer. It's actually another broker trying to find a buyer and then uh, at the end, they end up to find another broker, try to find another buyer. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I jump into this business. Um, you know, I, I, I did uh, uh, big investments in the uh, masks. Uh, I shipped, uh, you know, uh, more than 200 containers from China to the US in total. Uh, I, I, I think. At the beginning, uh, it was uh, all the people come to me, they say, oh, I want this mask, I want that mask, I want the Honeywell, I want the right I want AOK, -okay, I want every, every, I want whatever that you can, you can provide. Then all the buyers, they're actually, you know, in my mind, from the case I met, it's a, a little bit different from this uh, case. I have uh, received many, many uh, orders that people say, hey, I want to buy your mask. Uh, especially during the peak seasons um, in June, July, and August. Uh, and people send me, oh, I want you all your 500, uh, 5 million Honeywell. Okay, here is a, uh, they send me PO, uh, you know, 10 million, 15 million dollars, right? Like that's not the money, but none of those happen. Yeah. Uh, I don't think those are crimes, you know, I checked a lot of those people. Some of those are decent people. They just don't know what they're doing. They yep. don't have a buyer, but they thought that they can buy this and then resell to somebody else. Yep. I, I think that's lost in the translation and the communications. That's from the buyer side. From the seller side, you know, even they don't know what they're doing as well. Yeah. Right. True, true. From the, uh, you know, uh, their only story because... Um, Paul, every, everybody has been thrown into the deep end without knowing how to swim, and they're all trying to swim. So that is why these problems happen. Uh, Rainer, from a Top Glove perspective, Top Glove has been at the receiving end of a lot of these scams and issues. And what do you think and what is your perspective about these scams, what you have seen over the last year? You have to unmute. Rainer, you'll have to unmute yourself. Uh, actually, I'm I'm on two channels now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I have my 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 phone and my desktop. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. Just to play safe. All right. Okay. Think, think about the introduction. Yeah. Actually, what Douglas said in the beginning, need and greed. That is exactly what created the mega hype in the in the past history of uh, year 2020. So what does it mean? Uh, to look at the big picture, uh, over the years before, the market, uh, the market growth of gloves in the world was about 6 to 8%. All right. So now, uh, thanks to the pandemic, the bubble burst into the right direction for the glove makers and mask makers and PPA makers. So how how, how to manage that hype, that was actually a huge challenge uh, in the interest of customers, of course. So uh, I'm not talking about only the gray market, but our main interest was only to serve our customers. So, and of course we saw a lot of potential customers uh, so-called customers, potential customers, great customers, uh, and a huge number of friends. 
So I never made so many friends during the past one year. So they contacted me and you can help me. They want me to shortcut deliveries to other people. No way. <laughs> yeah. Market. I'm not so, talking about fraud. Only the gray market was of maybe more than 50% of the regular market. So I can, you can imagine that the challenge was for the whole industry to make such a huge number of extra deliveries. So no wonder uh, greed and need came into place. And actually it resulted to all uh, yeah, illegal deals, not so legal deals, and yeah, whatever kind of uh, fraud deals. Yeah. So uh, now I make a full stop. Yeah. What we need Arena, to do is are, actually, Arena, is in these stop. days, uh, to make a difference between uh, network security and uh, business security. So network security is being covered by cyber security facilities. You, so the more you are distributed, uh, your gloves or goods into the world, the more the umbrella functionality of cyber security counts. That's a very important factor. But no hacker can intervene into your uh, ecosystem. Now focus on the other side. I, I prepared some slides, uh, how the story went on in Top Love. Can you, Minesh? Yeah. Yeah, before we jump on to that, Rainer, I wanted to ask one more question for you guys, and then we can jump into uh, jump into that session for you. Uh, ba basically, uh, basically, I, I, I see that uh, we, we all have faced the same issues, uh, more because of the demand increase more than the supply could increase across products. Um, one of the things that I noticed was, say, Top Glove, for example, you have policies in place that can protect you. But there are others who don't have that many policies, who don't have that many offers in place to uh, safeguard people. And that's when their issues have happened. Um, I think, uh, for example, some of, some of the companies in Vietnam, some of the companies in Thailand, didn't have the paperwork in place. And they had sales directors who were uh, themselves promoting gray markets. Many of them have been uh, have been taken to jail by the local authorities and stuff. And we've all seen this, but people who have not done sourcing in the past don't really understand the challenges of this and they can't do it. So my question before we jump into Rainer, what Top, Top Glove has done, I wanted to ask a question to all of you as to in all the cases, how do you do the document checks what are the document checks to be done? And what is your advice to buyers who are genuine buyers who don't have much experience buying these things, but need the products, uh, genuinely need the products, not just to pedal them around? Doug? Sure. So, uh, and, and I preach this as well. I've done lots of videos on this, on keeping safe. Um, at this point in time, with the glove craze, um, anybody that's offering gloves should have a freaking history, pardon my French. So at this late stage in 2021, who's ever selling gloves should have previous performance, current performance, past performance. They should be able to show you bill of ladings, airway bills, SGS reports or whatever equivalent there is. They should be able to point to customers that they've delivered for. So anybody that's hiding that is, is hiding it for a reason, because I can tell you, you know, bill of ladings in nitro right now are like a badge of honor. I feel like I want to get every container number tattooed on my ass, to be honest with you. So the point is, is that nobody that's landed nitro is going to be hiding the fact that they landed nitro. I'll wallpaper my bathroom with it. You know, I mean, there's no reason to hide bill of ladings or airway bills so that people can contract, contract that you've done it. There's no reason to not connect somebody to your factory 
with either a call or, a, or an email back and forth to verify that you're working directly with a factory. Even as Rainer says, there's gray market, there's repackers, there's small factories with a few lines. They're still viable at this point, but I'm just telling you, if somebody can't and is not willing to produce a bill of lading or an airway bill on current and past performance, you need to just run because they're not real. The same with the uh, SGS reports, right? So SGS reports or TUV or Satras or AQS, whatever you're using, those need to be encrypted when you get them. Do yourselves a favor, go and get yourself a, a free or, or pay five or $10 for a PDF editor. And when you open an SGS report, if you can click on that and edit it, it's bullshit. Pardon, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's, not, it's not real. Uh, because they're supposed to be encrypted by the inspection company and you should not be able to just get in there and edit numbers or edit pictures and things like that. So if you can edit uh, an inspection report, that's fake. If you need help trying to track a container, if somebody's giving you a BOL or, or an airway bill that something's on a plane, it's really easy to track. After this meeting, I will post some links on, on uh, some of my posts or give you some links of places that are free where you can just just type in in google ocean container tracking you'll find something type in google free pdf editor and those two things will save you a ton i'm just saying by now if people aren't telling you if people aren't able to show you that they've delivered um you know they're they're just not real and I'll, the other thing i'll say is there's nowhere near as many buyers as everybody thinks there's 50 brokers trying to do the same deal there's a hundred people trying to buy gloves for Cinta. There's a hundred people trying to buy gloves for Granger. It's the same buy and buyers. Nowhere near as many buyers as you think. So there's that. And then the last thing I'm going to say, and I started pitching a bitch about this this weekend, is there's no reason that people should be marking up nitrile that lands in the U.S. to 15, 16, 17, 18 dollars. Okay, we're still, while it's still expensive, we're still landing it for nine, 10, $11. And for people to go and try to make five and $6 a box on this stuff, it's, it's just criminal. And uh, you know, they were cracking down on people with masks. They should start cracking down on people with nitrile. Because for somebody to make a quarter million dollars on a container, it's just, uh, it's just not right. So it's disgusting. We'll talk about some alternatives down the road. So that's all I got to say about that. I'll mute myself. And Paul? Yeah, I 100% agree with, with Doc that uh, whatever that uh, you claim you have the things, you don't hide the information that you can supply as a supplier. Uh, I think there will be two ways uh, for, for this kind of uh, sourcing. I, I, one is uh, for international sourcing, where that, uh, you know, Minash and the BioHive team is doing a great job in helping the people to identify the right suppliers um, on the ground in the in in Asia, they go to check go to connect you to the right people. Uh, I think if you don't have a reliable partners uh, came from China doing business in the U.S., I still have a hard times to identify the right supplier. Yeah, uh, that's why. I I do give gloves, you know, nitros in, in the U.S. Uh, because uh, the importers have done the right job to bring the stuff here. They should have uh, been able to supply you the right test reports, product certifications, 510K, whatever necessary, you know, uh, to identify the quality of the product, as well as the air way bill, uh, bill of lading, things like that. That should be pretty easy uh, to do to source in the U.S. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that that's what I want to say. Okay, um, and Rainer, so I will I will have the slides that you have, and you can talk to that. Yeah. Okay. Let me because greed need generating uh, criminal energy. But criminal energy has to have a target. So the target is sorted out very easily. <clears throat> Top Glove is the largest supplier in the world for gloves. We are the most uh, 
uh, uh, the most desired and most admired target. So, uh, in the history, we have already made certain experience before the pandemic. Because of our size, I just let you know, we are active with uh, 47 factories, uh, 762 production lines, running a company in Malaysia and in a few other countries for 21,000 employees. And our volume last year was of about 91 billion gloves which represents about that close to 30% market share globally. So we have customers via a large network of distributors in 190 countries. So look, you see that size is already a major attraction for touch points for, uh, yeah, for greedy people. <laughs> no matter whether it's criminal energy behind it. So we increased our team in sales and marketing significantly, of course, also the larger volume, but also we installed an investigation team, our own investigation team. So in total, last year, we realized 292 cases, mainly focused in Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore, Turkey, and China. Of course, we are in Malaysia, the most well-known company. Therefore, the, the greedy people are trying to make a quick buck here as friends, as non-existing distributors and however. So I make a shortcut now. Uh, over the past year, we launched over 30 police reports and uh, the police takes it very serious. Just recently, they uh, got a gang of eight people uh, arrested from in terms of this business. So I don't want to run, uh, if time allows, uh, Minesh, can I run this video now? Or yes. you click the button, please. Yes. Wait. I, will, I will have to share it. Okay. Yeah, share, share. Crimes has been on the rise globally. We are doing our part by raising awareness and sharing on how to prevent fraud. Fraudsters target victims by assessing to their sensitive data, such as personal details and financial statements. Oh no! Please, don't let this be you. Don't worry. Here's how we can help you. Let's see how these fraudsters work to treat you. Firstly, there will be discrepancies in the fraudster's email address that is different from our domain at topglove.com or topglove.com.my. Secondly, be alert if you are asked to send the money to a fraudulent account overseas, even though the payee Topglove Sandra Bahad is correct. Be alert on the payee's name. Thirdly, beware of the use of outdated Top Gloves logo and other discrepancies in documents presented to you. Fourthly, be very careful of fraudsters who present themselves as Top Gloves agents to deal with you. Lastly, we do not ask our customers to split and make payments to us via separate accounts, whether in Malaysia or overseas. Remember to go through these four important tips mentioned in Top Gloves website. When in doubt, please contact us via email, phone call, or WhatsApp message. Let's work closely together to ensure that no one is cheated by these frauds and scams. Please visit our website for more information. Thank you for watching. We we'll have to shut this up. Well, guys, I think the video speaks for itself. I think it's our obligation to safeguard our image in the market. 
as a trustful player. I give you one example of the many, many. Um, there was a deal done and then a scanner just by a frauded email to ask the customer uh, on behalf of his top glove uh, uh, email address to change the mode of payment to another bank. So immediately the payment went into to another bank account instead of Top Club. So it was not a damage to Top Club because, because of missing payment we did not deliver, but the deal got what was a loss for the for the customer, for the real customer. So many of those deals happened and luckily some police reports turned into a uh, good result suspected scammers got arrested. Uh, Rainer, uh, I will give, yeah. yeah. You got muted, sorry. So you can ask questions now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Rena, from your perspective, of course, we see, uh, I mean, what steps Top Glove has taken. And we understand uh, you need to take because of your size and because of being attacked by fraudsters all over uh, around. Um, we also know, I mean, as a matter of fact, we've discussed this before, and we know that Top Glove is not going to supply, uh, supply anymore. Buyers still are being offered by some people, oh, I can get you top glove or the top, um, gloves that are OEM manufactured by top glove. What do we what do we do in those situations? I mean, is there can you make a blanket statement that there is no top glove supply going to be available for the next six months or nine months? So if anybody's offering, don't go by that. I have a difficult question. Um, so it happened indeed various times that scammers introduced themselves as a dealer of top glove. And as evidence, they have shown some videos about uh, of uh, containers full of gloves. Yeah. Of course, a stolen photo, yeah? Yeah. So therefore, they attracted people to deal with them. Uh, so in, in, the, in the moment, this deal is running among the scammer and a potential customer, we have no access and no knowledge about it. But in the moment, there's the, the customer asking for maybe for their alliances, for me, more deliveries or later deliveries or change of modalities immediately pops up in our office. And then the scammer is being caught. So in other words, what I don't know, I think uh, it was uh, Paul mentioned in the beginning, our safeguarding internet security, our safeguarding business security can help ourselves, but not necessarily our customers. They have to be as um, responsible as we are. They have to safeguard their own interest. Yeah. And Marina, you and know... The interest is on on two levels. One is the cyber security level, the purely physical procedural security on the internet base, and on top, intelligent part is the business security level. Yeah. yeah. No, no, sir, Rainer, what is happening in the market is there are, uh, there are offers, uh, we see them all the time, even on LinkedIn, where people offer gloves that are manufactured by Top Glove, for example, Amex or Cardinal, which we know are manufactured at the Top, top Glove factories. And we know that there is no capacity left uh, to be manufactured, but we do get offers and many of the buyers in this group must have seen those offers. Uh, how, uh, what is the genuineness of this or it is, it is not possible to see these offers at all according to you? There's only one rule, just contact Top Glove directly first. Okay. So attendees, one, as, as Rainer says, just contact Top Glove. Let's jump on to the next topic.
right? And the next topic is about the production capacity of gloves uh, and what is being shipped, especially into the US market. And I know um, Doug has done some analysis onto this. There is one a typo here. It is not 330 billion nitrile gloves. It is 330 billion gloves. 60% of that is nitrile, 40% of that is latex. Um, Doug, do you want to talk about the data and your research onto this and what you have discovered over the last year? Uh, sure, Manesh. And, and it was really great catching up with Rainer before the meeting because obviously he is uh, an amazing expert and, and uh, probably one of the top uh, <laughs> persons that you can get information for, for nitrile. Uh, so he corrected me and said that 30, 330 billion is not just nitro gloves. That's uh, only 60% of that is nitro gloves. Um, and also that number is supposed to be for 2020. So I boxed that chart pretty well. But also um, Rainer informed me that uh, while they don't have the numbers yet for 2020 or 2021, production is probably going to move up another 20 to 25% on top of that. But still only 60% of that number is going to be nitrile. So I think, you know, I posted this, the, this by the numbers before, mostly just to show what's actually coming into the US so that I can easily dispel the fact that nobody has 20 million, 10 million, 15 million, 30 million, 100 million. Nobody is bringing that into the US on a regular basis. I track it every week and I post it every month. And while Rainer corrected me and said the U.S. demand is closer to 25%, um, again, if you take that number uh, at the top and, and make it only 60%, it still is going to equate down to about 30 to 40 million boxes of nitrile uh, coming into the U.S. every month. And so you need to start with the numbers to find out what's possible. If somebody's saying they have 100 million boxes of Superior, which isn't even shipping into the US because of fraud, it hasn't shipped in since April, you should just be able to look at the, the production numbers and know that's not true. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, starting with the math is really important, what's possible and what's not. People even talk about, you know, five, getting 5 million boxes a month. You know, a million boxes a month is 34 shipping containers. That's, that's stuffing a container every day. And you know, I've been importing for a long time. That's an awful lot of product to move every day. And I've had orders for 500,000, 700,000. Those go out over months, not days. It just doesn't happen that way. We just don't, nobody has that capacity. People talk about putting 250,000 boxes of gloves on a plane in one shot. <laughs> gloves don't come out in 250,000 lots. 16 containers of gloves just don't miraculously just pop into a plane somewhere. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. So, you know, you got to know the facts, know what's possible because people will say anything. And if you don't know your business, you don't need to be in this business. If you don't know what you're talking about, you're either going to get your buyer in trouble or you're going to get yourself in trouble. And yeah. so once you start with what's, rea what's reality, I wouldn't even take an order if somebody wants more than a half a million boxes a month. That's, a, that's 16 containers. It's an awful lot of work. So you got to know the numbers. That's, I'll, I'll end on that. And, and Doug, we discussed this before. Uh, I mean, you and I both have been stuck with some of our money stuck with these suppliers too. It's, and we have a lot of experience and we have people on the ground. So if people don't have people on the ground and if you don't uh, have trusted sources, uh, please, please beware of doing business. And people who don't take accountability, especially those brokers who are just making you sign these uh, multiple NDA and CNDAs and trying to tell you that they can get you 5 million boxes of gloves, that's just not happening, uh, which is very similar to Paul. We, we saw, I mean, I, I'm sure you saw it and I saw it also when people used to offer 35 million uh, 3M 1860 sitting somewhere in Taiwan or Thailand or Malaysia. And we all got those videos and photos. Um, do you want to share some of your capacity related uh, experience that you have with these uh, masks? And Minesh, can I make some additional comment yeah, I on, think, uh, on Douglas' comment? Uh, Actually, sure, sure. The industry is facing uh, very, very many new challenges. 
So as we all know, and take the numbers of Douglas, the, sh the shipping of containers towards the United States, uh, which made about 25% of our revenue stream. So it's an amazing experience for a while not to be able to supply. What happened? Due to the fact that the Chinese population behaves very well, their economy is dry, running crazy, growing. What happens as a consequence, the shipping capacity for China Oh, we lost you. Rainer. Increasing significantly. Empty vessels are sick and empty containers are part of auction now. So we are sitting now for a while on full containers, but don't see any any empty vessel. Yes. <laughs> because auction basis. And on auction basis, the shipping capacity is by the Chinese already. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we come back to Paul. Uh, Raina, let's have Paul talk about the master. Yeah, thank you, Manish. Uh, I, I think for mask, uh, except that, uh, you know, if we say there is a, still a shortage in masks, that's probably the only thing that uh, uh, missing the, for the 3M's um, surgical respirator, uh, NIOSH N95. So I, I think a lot of people still uh, make uh, advertisements say, hey, God, I got uh, 300 million uh, 3M 1860 in Hong Kong or, or, or somewhere in Asia. Uh, that's, that's impossible, I, I think. Uh, you know, uh, basically um, even 3M has working hard to increase their capacity. Uh, by end of this year, they said that they're going to increase the capacity to 2 billion a year. So basically you do the math, that's about uh, less than 100 million a month. Uh, you know, that's not just for US, that's for global. Uh, you know, that, that's uh, even no matter how hard they want to supply or in the US, but they, 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 there are other factories in different locations are supplying to different countries. So many countries in demand of the 3M. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's the only thing that you could not increase the, the capacity. Otherwise, for our, for the rest of the world, you know, uh, BYD has done a really good job to uh, build a huge capacity. You know, they can produce uh, up to 50 million a day. <laughs> sounds, that sounds crazy. But that, that, that's how China has helped the world to uh, stop the shortage of the masks. You know, without all the Chinese electronics companies, even like my own company uh, and my partners in China, we were from the electronics uh, business and we built out the rest overnight. So, but for nitros, we could not do it. That's why we, we tried uh, really hard to make a study. We even started uh, the feasibility of building the nitro glass production line. And the finally, you know, we gave up. Like, like I, I told you, Manesh, you know, we, we want to do that, but uh, we could not do it. Yeah, it yeah. did not justify. Yeah. I do know there are some uh, large Chinese companies are jumping into the game. They are uh, putting billions of dollars in building the large production lines. Uh, I, I just wish them good luck when they finish up the product, uh, building of the factories. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, thank, thank you, Paul. Um, there is a lot of q and A. I mean, a lot of people are asking questions. We will come to the questions. Um, let's get through this and we will come to the questions in the next 10 minutes. Don't worry, I've asked Paul, Doug and Rainer to answer all your questions. So we will answer it to you. Okay, uh, Rainer, from your side, right? This is a question more for you and for nitrile as well as latex. Where are the main production facilities? We know, of course, Malaysia. Malaysia is the largest producer and Top Glove is the largest producer in the world. <coughs> Who are the other big players, according to you? And where are the production facilities around the world? Uh, Rainer, you need to unmute. Sorry, I, I, yeah. I have to double check because I'm talking on my phone and, and my desktop. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Um, 
Number one is, of course, uh, to laugh. And around us in Malaysia, we are uh, the largest formation of glove manufacturing in the world. So, of course, now Vietnam, Thailand, China. So, we are going out of Malaysia. Uh, I think what I don't know now is that many people, uh, due to the gold mining effect, you know, the gold mining effect is for me the average sales price uh, skyrocket high to two and a half to three and a half times higher than normal. So people make huge money now. So, and there are a lot of investors in the world screening the, the new uh, opportunities under the pandemic considerations. And they find out, oh, PEP is a new investment opportunity, mm. especially glove making. So mm. they invest into glove making in the new glove making industries in various uh, countries or continents. I got known somehow, somehow in China. I got known somehow a bit in Americas. I don't know where exactly and more in, in Europe. That means the production facilities in my consideration are going more global. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, China has good capacities. I mean, I know Blue Sail Factory, Inco Factories have visited them in the past, and we are working direct with uh, these factories. What we realize is all of their, no matter how big their facilities are, it's the same situation as Top Glove. They're all filled up. And that answers to, uh, I mean, that leads to the next question. What are the lead times now? Uh, what I am seeing, and I don't know if you guys are seeing the same, but what I am seeing in the market is that uh, only the small guys with small capacities are able to offer anywhere around 60 days. Most of the others are 180 days, uh, like the, all the big ones are 180 days. Some of them are even uh, 360 days a year uh, of waiting. So are you guys seeing the same or are you seeing anything different from your side? Doug? Hey, um, so I want to ask Rainer a question, actually, to just kind of follow this up, and I think it'll lead to this. So um, Rainer at, at one point said, I think uh, you have 700 and what did you say? 780 lines? 726 lines. 700 what? 726 lines, I think he said. Uh, check him again. I thought they had 720 lines, but he just said they have 780 or 90. Hmm. Rainer, can you jump in here? It's again, 47 factories, right. 762 okay. production lines. And can I ask you a question, Rainer? How many are you yes, guys sure. building right now? Uh, pardon me? How many are under construction right now? Are you expanding lines? Oh, yeah, we're expanding lines uh, under construction. Uh, I'd say about 50 building gloves expansion. Mm. So that's huge. So you're going to almost double in size. No, so you're not double. Uh, uh, 50 of 90, about 50, 45%. Yeah, but, okay, so about 45%. That's huge. That's okay, huge, so yeah. there's lines opening all over the place. You're not the only one, right? So there's a, there's a um, joint venture going on in Vietnam between Koi Han, uh, 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 Everglobal, and NamViet. They're opening 80 lines on 55 exactly. hectares, what you meant. There's uh, obviously Heart of Lagos opening lines. Um, there's lots of small places that are opening 15, 20, 40 lines. We know Inco and Hongre, Blue Sail, Beijing region, all those players in China are opening lines. So I think my big question, Rainer, is, um, is NBR, right? So the raw materials to make nitrile, we have, you know, there's gonna be all these new lines but who's gonna really be able to get the NBR? It's my understanding that there's only three to five players in the marketplace, mm -hmm. Cinepec being probably one of the biggest, right? Mm -hmm. And so my question is, obviously you guys as the Goliath in the industry are gonna be able to you know, procure plenty of NBR to do your production. But what, where do you think some of these smaller players that are opening 15, 20 lines that are trying to you know, be in this, maybe not the gray market, but you know, almost the black and blue market, you know, are they going to be able to get NBR to actually make gloves? Actually, uh, 
four answers to your questions. Number one is we do our own MBR plant in Malaysia to go, be more independent from those uh, uh, product deliveries. Number two is uh, as a strategic matter, time to market. So how fast can you roll out a high quality plant? So I think you mentioned a number of players. Of course, they're all on our radar screen. Not only those, but many more in the world. Sure. And uh, the question is, how solid is their business case? How can they really uh, outline the factory and how long does it take in, in practice? There's no answer yet. So there are various models of manufacturing lines of factories as such, from uh, conventional factories to uh, high-tech factories. So high-tech factories of the future can reduce the lead time significantly, but they are not available yet. So that means I, we take all these new players very serious, but we also see a lot of fallout because they may not make it because the source of delivery for the product to set up a manufacturer is also limited. So it means, uh, if you ask me uh, out of the blue uh, consideration, definitely not more than 50% can make it of those who are just new in the market. That's amazing. So for us, come the future is, of course, is a time to market. That's more so critical that, than ever before. That's an amazing statement, but Rainer, I would have to believe that you're, um, you're adding almost 50% capacity to the world's largest nitro factories in the world, the largest nitro producer in the world. And you're adding 50%. So obviously you're seeing a very long range uh, growth in nitro gloves, right? I mean, you wouldn't be investing in almost going 150% more in capacity if you didn't see a long-term strategic upside to nitro, right? Of course, with a positive perspective, uh, the introduction of uh, surgical glass in principle as a main product uh, is of high efficiency because people get used of it. They never used natural glass before. Yeah. So yeah. By, because the new hygienic ecosystem in the world will increase the natural uh, uh, growth of demand. Mm. And there's another fact. It's a simple rule. If you get vaccinated per vaccination, per shot, two gloves for the doctor and the assistant. Yeah. So, and you get a second shot, another two gloves. <laughs> yeah. So, we ride the waves in the right nice of time. Yeah, yeah. Apparently the CDC came out and said that you don't need gloves to administer the vaccine. And didn't your stock fall when that was announced? Actually, uh, I cannot make any comment on that. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> so, but, I feel like that, but, but, but the, <laughs> that, all right. Fair that's, 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 I think we'll leave it to the stock market to determine. All right, what is the options for the nitrile, if not nitrile, right? I mean, if we cannot have enough capacity of nitrile, I, I know that the US, um, US will not take latex because of the allergy issues and the concerns of the allergies, but what are the other options? And what do you think uh, you're seeing in the market? I, I'll speak first and then Rainer can actually correct me because I'm sure he's smarter than I am. <laughs> So very interesting about latex. I feel like they really get the redheaded stepchild treatment. Uh, my, my research says that only point like 1% of the world's population is allergic to latex. But I feel like probably over the years, it was like a, a, a giant marketing campaign by Nitro to, uh, to beat the crap out of latex, like the peanut allergies for kids and things like that. So I, I don't understand why latex isn't an option. Um, but I'll let Rainer speak to that. The next, obviously, is the, uh, the synthetic blends of uh, vinyl and, uh, and nitrile, or they call vitrile. And obviously, Top Glove, make, Top Glove makes all these hybrids, by the way. Uh, and so do others. You know, like Inco makes a very nice nitrile blend 
Andre makes a nice nitro blend and lots of other companies in China. It's pretty well uh, relegated to China right now for that besides, uh, besides Top Club. So blends have become very, very popular and there are some with 510Ks and uh, there's medical exam ones and lots of people are selling those in the US. Again, that price has skyrocketed as well. I'm starting to see on the ground prices of 12 and $13. You know, I mean, that's, it's 30% it's or even 20%, sometimes even 10% nitrile. So that's a replacement. Then there's exam grade vinyl. And of course, I think the only place that's, you know, really doing a lot of that is in, in China and obviously Thanks. Top Glove as well. But yeah. There's exam grade vinyl. I do a lot of that for, uh, for some of the medical labs um, that aren't able to afford nitrile, um, but it hasn't gained the popularity that I thought it would as prices for nitrile, you know, continue to escalate. And then the last thing that I've uncovered, and of course, <laughs> Top Glove is already doing this as well, is exam grade TPE or those polymer gloves, CPE, I think you do those as well. Um, and again, you know, those aren't gonna be uh, good for anybody at the, at the at doing any type of, you know, really intense medical uh, procedures, but certainly down at the lower levels for taking blood pressure, for giving vaccines, for veterinaries, for dental, you know, for some medical places, senior living care. I think that TPE glove right now that's selling for about, you know, two and a half bucks a, a, a hundred, is a great alternative. So that's what I know from nitro all the way down to TPE. Um, other than that, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know that there's anything more. I think Rainer's probably going to have the inside scoop on all that. Take it away, Rainer. Okay, thank you for playing the ball across the field. Uh, first of all, top of is the not only the largest supply of gloves, but also with the largest variety of products. The only product we don't have is industrial gloves. The rest from A to Z, vinyl, latex, and of course the main product is now nitrol. So ni why is nitrol in favor? Because of the non-allergic uh, 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 concerns. And we are the first one, who delivered uh, nitrile gloves as biodegradable gloves, number one in the world. So that is a good move forward and a good result of our major R&D effort. So on, on the other hand, you need to understand the gloves, high quality gloves, per piece of 2.7 gram. That's it. Do it on a high quality basis. Not easy. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so it means uh, the future of nitrile, as it is now so sophisticated, it will be over long term. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my consideration is in terms of innovation, of course, we will improve the machinery, the dipping part, there are formers which can be optimized. The whole thing is under renovation now and uh, under innovation. Mm. But the main product will remain the same. I think at the end, we will go more high tech on much lower cost and anywhere in the world. Mm. Okay. Um, I, I want to answer some of the questions that have been asked uh, by buyers and all of you are uh, welcome to jump in. Uh, let me read the first question. Um, it is, one of our buyers paid a leading brand in Vietnam and advanced payment, uh, and now are battling out the refund. This is a reputed company. How do we get our money back? What routes can we take? Oh, I'll speak to that just because we're pretty embedded in Vietnam. So... Um, Number one, those company, those people can't go anywhere because they're on lockdown. So it's not like they can flee the country. So I would suggest getting a lawyer. Uh, first of all, you're going to definitely need to get representation. But I'll tell you three or four things that they don't like in Vietnam. Uh, nobody in Vietnam wants to uh, mess with uh, newspapers, the police, or the FDA, right? So while you don't have a ton of leverage, especially if they don't have the money, you really need to get a lawyer. 
they're not that expensive in Vietnam. If you need some help, reach out to me. We're, we're like I said, we have some good people in Vietnam. Um, and um, but but you're definitely going to have to do something. And uh, one is to get a lawyer. The next is to go to the press. Then you go to the police, and then you go to the FDA. You go to all of them, and they will put pressure on to help you get your money back if there's money to get back. Again, these people can't go anywhere. And if it's a decent company, and you were working directly with the company, I, I will tell you, there's only there's only three or four really reputable companies in Vietnam. And if you weren't working directly with Koi Han or or Nam Viet or um, or uh, Ever Global. Your money didn't go to them. Um, you're you're dealing with a third party, and you're you're in trouble. If it went to a factory that actually owns an FDA, you have a little bit of leverage. So, reach out to me. I'll try to help. Yeah, um, I'm picking one more question for you guys, which is, uh, I think somebody is asking about payment terms, and that reminds me is that. Is it safe to do transactions uh, with bank guarantee and LCs uh, for gloves or masks in Ch uh, China, Taiwan, Vietnam, Thailand? Is it safe for buyers to pay by LCs? Anybody want to answer that? You know my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I I can I can take that uh, also, and I can answer that. It is safe. It is not completely uh, unsafe, but you need to understand the entire LC uh, channel, which bank you're using, what is the bank that you're opening to. If you're doing a transferable LC, uh, what are the terms uh, that are set between you and uh, uh, the transferee and then the end, end seller? And unless until you understand all of that and you have experience with that, uh, be careful. Uh, don't waste too much time on it or work with somebody who will take responsibility for it because most of the middlemen try to do that and they don't take responsibility. Uh, one of the things we are doing at BiHive is also related to that and we've tried to do it uh, pretty responsibly. We use HSBC in Hong Kong to get those deals through, uh, but it is not always that simple. Let's jump into Raider one more. Not take LCs, do they? Do they take LCs and escrows? Yeah, LC is not so much escrows. We, we've been working with, for example, Intco also, we can do LCs with them. Or with Hungre also, we can do LCs with them. Or yeah, these, as long as you're going to direct to the factory and not through a third party. Yeah, yeah. So so we, we're doing that. There's another question. What is the market price EXW 100 box? Are there gloves under eight US dollar? What is the lead time? <laughs> no, there is nothing under $8. Not, not anymore. There's nothing under eight dollars. There's yeah. not really. I mean, to get gloves and get them packed, you you need to be over ten. Yeah. You might find some pockets under under ten, but they will pass over your orders. It's like uh, uh, this is this is an interesting commodity because it's. It, and I was going to say this one time before Manash is that there's people that will come to me and go, I got thirty years in the medical business. And then I'll tell them, well, I got, you know, two and a half decades in the import and we're still idiots when it comes to nitrile and masks and things because it's moving so fast. I've never dealt with a commodity that I could put in an order on one, Monday and by Friday, the price has gone up a dollar a box and that factory just doesn't want to pack for you anymore. You yeah. know, you, and you also have some rich countries. I, I see Rainer just laughing, right? He's like, but like you'll have uh, Japan walk, you know, come in as a buyer and say, look, they don't care. $120 a box, that's $12 a box at the factory. $15 a box, they'll pay that at the factory. Rainer knows his stuff. Inco is selling for $18, $19 a box at the factory. So to think that you can get gloves right now for $8 a box, you're getting repacks, probably half of them are used. And you may never see, you more than likely never see them. So that's not happening. Yeah. It's just not. So I would say 10 to $12 is the price that's happening right now. And the other issue that we have on top of that is freight charges and trying to get them out of the country because there's no containers, you know, in, in a lot of the countries. Yeah. Uh, one more question, uh, which is for, I think Paul also can answer to this one, which is, is the PPE space maturing? Are a lot of people chasing the easy money, starting to go back to their day job? Are you seeing those kind of people disappear? 
Yes, I see a lot of people disappeared. You know, uh, I, I, I think the easiest way to uh, make money is to find a buyer and go to find a seller, right? But if there is no buyer, so you, you have nothing to do. Uh, um, uh, Oh, oh, what, what I, I have been in jobs that repeat orders. Uh, were very few new new people coming into this field, and even the older people. Uh, I, a lot of our brokers, you know, uh, they 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 said they are no longer dealing with PPEs. Yeah, yeah, because they are dis disappointed. Many people they did not make money. <laughs> yeah, and they spent a year without doing any business. No. Yeah. yeah, they were fooled by all the numbers. Yes, <laughs> Every, everybody thought they could make a, a become a millionaire selling gloves. So, um, also something for Rainer. There are a bunch of questions for you. One, which is when is the capacity going to be increased by forty five percent? When do you expect that to happen? And second is, will Top Glove uh, onboard new genuine trading companies? Uh, to work with you guys. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, the capacity increase will go into stages. So it, it is not a one time happening, it goes over the next two years. So at the end of the next two years, we have more capacity, like the additional 45 uh, billion gloves, yearly capacity. Mm. So it means time to market is also a determinator for the price. And in between, we have spot markets and the price is going beyond $15, one five dollars yeah? So it's a, it's a, it's a certain dam is being built. Uh, and uh, our con the market is still growing at the same pace like now over the next two years. And we are observing the market very carefully, how it will work afterwards. Hmm. Okay. So also one more related question is what, what documents do we present to Top Glove um, if we have U.S. government pending contracts? Again, please. They, they want to buy on the behalf of U.S. government. I think you answered this question that you don't have capacity right now, no matter who the buyer is. But there is still a question as to what documents can they present if they want to buy from you for U.S. US government contracts? Uh, it's, a, uh, not, it's not a theoretical case. If the U.S. government wants to buy more, they will go to one of their dealers. Yeah. They have authorized dealer concept. And they will provide all the conditions. They know what to do. Yeah. There's nothing new. Yeah. I, I think what Rainer's saying is if the government wants to go and buy gloves from Top Glove, they don't go find a broker to go ask Top Glove. They know they, those guys know to go to Top Glove. Yes. I, yeah, they I, have I, their own procurement agencies. Right. Yeah. So if somebody is telling you that they actually for uh, the question, the answer that question also, if somebody is telling you that they have government contracts, they don't know what they're talking about. The government contracts don't come like that, and government contracts uh, don't come to middlemen like that. And many times it happens like this. Yeah. That they work on behalf of the European Union, on behalf of Hungary, on behalf of Germany, on behalf of elsewhere in the world. Yeah. And end of the day, you do due diligence. There's nothing behind. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, we've, we've all wasted a lot of time. I mean, even uh, even us, we've, we've got so many people who claim to have government contracts, uh, state contracts, hospital contracts, which is really not there because none of these agencies actually need middlemen who don't know anything about sourcing. Mm, exactly. So. Well, I think there was a time where people were getting POs and then trying to reverse engineer them and trying to find the goods. Like they got POs awarded to them by like, I don't know, silly buyers that didn't know any better. And then they worked for months to try to, you know, reverse engineer and actually find somebody that could sell. I'm sure Paul's dealt with that for a ton of times with masks, right? <laughs> yeah, I keep telling people, 
you know, uh, you, you don't, you, you, you will not believe this. All the people get fooled by people. They trust they are dealing with the genius buyer. Mm. They keep telling me, Paul, this is true. I tell <laughs> him, I don't know who you are dealing with. I don't know, uh, but you know, I have received so many times, you know, five million Honeywell or, or, or five million Macrite, whatever. They give me the orders. They say, oh, I'm going to get the money. I'm going to send you the money tomorrow. I said, no, I don't expect that. Don't push me. I have the goods in the warehouse. You are welcome to do the in inspection any time. Yeah. But I'm not pushing you for that. What yeah, I said that, that's not true. <laughs> so, somebody else asked us, can we create a separate community where there are people who can get the buyer and seller so that the fraudsters and nail brokers pitching millions can be filtered out, like create the top 2% of the genuine business community. I think this is why we can create a buy hive. <laughs> I mean, I want to speak to that. I mean, that's what buy hive is all about. Yeah. And, uh, would love to see PPE get off of you know social media platforms like LinkedIn and 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 uh, WhatsApp and 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 Facebook. It's just ridiculous. That's where all that fraud and and crap comes in. And you guys have done such a great job of trying to make that safe environment, verified environment. And it, it just uh, it, it's amazing how resistant people are. And I know you guys are doing well and you're do, doing the right thing. And I, I support all of that. But for whatever reason, you know, everybody, everybody wants that, you know, crappy casino. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to go to the Bellagio. They all want to go downtown to the Golden Nugget, you know, and roll the dice at, 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 at LinkedIn and, and what's up at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Um, it's but crazy. The, but that's why what we did with Buy High, right? We created and we spent a lot of money in creating the tools so that it can be all transparent. And we we let the suppliers put their real prices. So if you see the prices from Intco or Hongre, these are real prices in the market and their own staff uploading, managing it. Or we have your products, for example, your wives and stuff. You guys manage it. And we only charge a small platform fee, which is again, transparent. We wanted to build it in such a way that we can be completely transparent. Of course, this year it is PPEs. In the future, there will be other products. But that is that is the only way of solving this mess and cleaning up this nonsense that we see all the time, right? There's one more question. How do you feel about brokers and broker chains? Who wants to answer that? <laughs> I'm going to let Paul start. I'm happy to jump in. Rainer won't know anything about it, so... Paul? Uh, uh, thank you yeah. very much, Doc. You know, I'm dealing with brokers. Every, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I deal with a lot of brokers, uh, uh, I would like to say. Uh, most of my business uh, were sold through brokers. Some good brokers, they can really close the deal. Uh, they bring large orders. You know, that's uh, but they have to be directly with the final buyer. If you are not direct, if you just heard somebody that uh, they, they, they want, they can bring you some business. Those people are, you know, just wasting their time. So I think the most important for a broker is to really know who the final buyer is. I actually have some small brokers did a good job. You know, they were calling the hospitals. Uh, they have no connections. Uh, they were calling to the you know, nursing homes, very down to the ground. So they don't bring me large orders, but they, 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 that's a, if they work hard, they can get uh, uh, you know a lot of uh, you know orders. Actually, you know they may. I I I have several brokers dealing with this, uh, made made a very big money. So that that's a uh, my advice to the brokers is very easy. Don't trust the people that come to you. You got to find your own buyer. Don't say that, oh, I know a seller, that there was somebody that uh, come to you and they say, hey, can you get this? Then you, you said, you, you thought you'd know a buyer. It's not. Yeah. And the, the next question is, how do I identify a genuine buyer in terms of documentation, which is the extension of the whole thing? Yeah. 
Look, I mean, I, I'm not a huge fan of all this documentation. There's just way too many acronyms and weird stuff in the marketplace that has nothing to do with importing and buying. I mean, th that's one of the things that, I'm, that I was trying to explain earlier is that there's not as many real buyers. Uh, there's a lot of tire kickers and uh, there's a lot of people that are shopping price and that's fine. And there's a lot of brokers that, that are selling the same deal. I mean, I, I, I've identified it before, you know, we're like 12 people are coming to me for the same deal. And um, I, look, I, yeah, I, I, I would add to that, Doug. I mean, buyer. a real buyer has actually bought before. Yeah. That, but that, that's that's the thing that that is very easy to do the documentation check, right? So, for example, you and I connected on LinkedIn, right? We know our backgrounds. We can see what are the common connections, who we worked with, what companies we were at. And that gives a confidence level immediately. Uh, Paul and I worked at the same company in the past. We never met them at that time, but we get it gives that confidence. That, okay, these guys have done business. This is the people that you can work with. Uh, same thing with buyers. It is very important to do a little bit background check. If somebody has a profile that had nothing before 2020 March, and suddenly he's saying he wants to buy 5 million boxes of uh, nitrile gloves from you or 20 million 3M1860, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I, you know, I use one question when I uh, ask if a broker is bringing me somebody, I say, what are they going to do with the gloves? Why are they buying the gloves? Yeah. Why I mean, in the beginning, I've done everything. I've done from mass to therm thermometers to wipes to we did we did all the curves, and then I decided to pick a lane. And Paul's done a brilliant job of picking a lane and becoming you know like the mass the mass guy, the king of mass. But you know, um, for me, I want to know what people are doing. If they're if they're just buying them to flip them at five six eight dollars profit, you know, to to kind of flip the marketplace. I'm not thrilled with dealing with that person. I want to know they're going somewhere to do something. I'm, I'm not altruistic, but I, you know, I, do, I do want to know who's buying them. You know, people will come to me and go like, you know, I have, a, I have a black Amex card and I can buy two containers a month and flip them for this. And I've done the numbers, you know, and you know, those aren't the people that I really want to work with, to be honest with you. Yeah. People that have worked with me know that I turn down tons of people. I, I very, very selective about who I'll work with right now. Um, it's just not worth it. It's a really hard business yeah. and to work with, you know, crazy people, not good. <laughs> yeah. so somebody is asking, one broker said to me that she can get one container trial order for me for cranberry nitrile gloves by sending her LC. Uh, before volume contract signed, will this be possible? Is cranberry produced by Top Glove? Cranberry is not produced by Club, Top Glove, but I'll let Rainer speak to that. They have their own production facilities in Malaysia, but, but I'm telling you, you're not getting one container from Cranberry ever in a million years. Yes, <laughs> just forget right, it. Rainer, cranberry, uh, cranberry is not made by Top Glove. It's a different company. Yeah. yeah. But you're not getting it. Yeah. One container. Yeah, that's not happening. Uh, somebody else asked, brokers say there are millions of nitriles in FTZ in Turkey. And I have received videos confirming that. What is your reaction to that? <laughs> what is the FCZ? Is that like free, free trade, trade zone? zone? Free trade zone in Turkey. So, yeah, my, my feeling is, is that why would they move them from country of origin all the way to Turkey yeah. to sit out? export them somewhere else it just doesn't even make any logistical sense at all right like paul's laughing like you like you'd move the gloves all the way over to turkey and then try to export them out yeah you know i i've heard of this so many times we we heard about uh like 300 million uh, 3m1860 sitting somewhere they made in thailand and they're now sitting somewhere in canada and that can only ship to europe and i was like it doesn't just make sense. Why? Why am I doing going through that logistics headache? And I mean, imagine how much, how many containers that is, and what logistics are involved. So all these uh, things of people saying that they have millions of these sitting in different free trade zones and stuff doesn't exist. Yeah, they, they make up all. They make up some really crazy stories, right? Yeah. How many? How much? How much PPE is in the Netherlands? 
I mean, that country's like that big. Yeah. Like, like there's five billion boxes of gloves in the Netherlands. Yeah. Why? How can yeah. that <laughs> They built an entire another island of the Netherlands, <laughs> and it's all made of gloves. Yeah. Um, one more question. So we have a lot of questions, which is great. Guys, we have, we will give five more minutes to this. Please wind up all your questions by that time. I'll try to answer as many by that time. After that, we'll have to call it quits on this. So this is a question. What is the production capacity of chemo gloves and other special gloves now? And uh, is, is that all or should we focus on plain medical examination gloves instead? God, I want this question. Okay. Pick me, pick me. <laughs> so chemo gloves is another one, right? So that's the, that's the uh, ASTM 6978 or 6798, whatever. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that there's nowhere near the demand on chemo gloves that everybody makes out to be. If you had a crap load of chemo gloves right now, you'd, you'd move them no different than if you had an ASTM 6319. Yeah. Rainer, can you speak to, to chemo gloves a little bit? Like, what's your what's your demand worldwide on chemo rated gloves? Is it like that far above regular medical grade? Unmute. Uh, unmute, Rainer. The current the current portfolio is enhanced with this type, but uh, the, the the real increment of growth was happening last year. So I cannot make any, I cannot get any real number how it was because it does not known to me. So my personal opinion is, is it's like, like, again, I think it's inflated demand. Uh, and, and I'm not 100% sure what the reason is. And just, a, just an FYI on, on chemo rated gloves. So the chemo test is like 12,000 bucks. And it takes about two months. And it, and, it, and it has to be done, like they can't do it in China, has to go to Singapore, they can't do it in Vietnam, it has to go to the US. There are plenty of gloves that would pass the, the, the testing, but no factory wants, really wants to spell, spend $12,000 and wait two months. Um, there, there's not that much difference to pass that test. They're not making that much more of a special glove. So there's that. And, and, and I just believe that the, uh, the demand is overinflated and, and they're hard to find. Top Club makes one, Hungre makes one, Inco makes one, uh, Blue Cell makes one, you know, but there's not a ton of factories that make it that have tested. There's not enough supply, yeah. And then actually there's a lot more that have tested for the EN, I think it's uh, 374 or something, the EN qualifications for chemo, which I think is, 374, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or something like that. 455, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There it is. Sorry, sorry. 455. My, yeah. my bad. Um, there's a lot more gloves that qualify for European chemo than they do for US. Yeah. To my 455, 1, 2, 3, 4 is existing. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Okay. There is one more question. I am a PPE broker and have been trying to make some money since March, 2020. Haven't made anything. Should I leave this sector? Let me answer to this. If you haven't made your money in 2020, do not waste your time. This is not a market where you will make money that easily. It is real hard work and you really need connections. You really need understanding of sourcing. Uh, does anybody else have anything else to add on top of that? I, I, listen, I think I understand how so many people have moved into this into this business, and and uh, uh, it looked like you know a, a gold rush, just like uh, when marijuana became legal. You can see tons of people moved into the the CBD space, uh, cryptocurrency. Everybody moved into that, and that's just kind of normal, you know. People see those opportunities. I hope the people that did it learned some things, got some experience, met some people, got some education on things and, and are able to find a way, a path forward in, into something different, but there's just not enough room for everybody, right? I mean, you need sellers, you need, you know, really good uh, buyers, really good sellers. There's not a lot of really, I mean, the brokers is another word for a sales rep, right? Yeah. There's just, not enough need for brokers in this industry. Most buyers want to deal directly with the seller. 
even in any other business that I worked with where there was a rep in between, the bigger buyers want to work directly with the seller. Yeah. Um, and so, again, I see why everybody had jumped into it. Uh, and it looked like, you know, I mean, I, I went from like a thousand followers or connections to 30,000 connections and, and tons of them are from Bitcoins and gold and, and CBD and marijuana and, and other things that probably had these type of runs, you know, yeah. but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I feel bad for anybody because the hours are ridiculous. I know people that have been up 18, 20 hours a night a day, you know, they've, they've struck, they've uh, stressed out their family life in the middle of a pandemic, yep. no less, which is worse, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, go find something else to do. This can't um, be that much. <laughs> yeah, and there is more. I want to make uh, one more comment on top. Uh, actually, what is the prime uh, advantage of Top Love? Top Love is riding on a global, global a trusted network of distributors. So we are an OEM and we have established our OEM partnerships by a in no. 20 countries. So I mean the, the potential of brokerships and, and all this stuff on the way to the customer. So I mean the best, the best to be out of this speculative area is to run a trusted global network. Now, it would be great if you had any production. I'm sure everybody would like to do business with you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Unfortunately, nobody can. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so they so, go running around looking for alternatives. We, we're going to take two last questions. Uh, one, one is for 3M1860. Somebody's asking, uh, what is the dealer cost of 3M1860? Someone is offering goods at 3.9 US dollars. Uh, Paul, you are the expert at this. Uh, that depends on where the, you can get the goods. You know, actually in the authorized distributors, you get a 3M under a dollar. Yeah. Uh, just to say anywhere between, <clears throat> you know, 80 some cents. Yeah. You know, that, that, that's the real, real price for, 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 for yeah. the 3M. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and beyond that, uh, you know, most people are dealing with the what do we call overflow market, right? Where the, yeah. the traditional market that the uh, that the price goes sky high. So I think at three point nine or whatever, anything over, uh, you know, three dollars is sounds ridiculous. But uh, that's the reality that where you cannot find it. Some people are using that chance to make money. Yeah. Is that against the law right now, Paul, for 3M? It is. It is, right? Uh, that, yeah, it is, yes. It is. It, it's risky. So that, that's why, you know, anybody asking me for 3M, I said, no, I don't have. Yeah. Yeah, I have a I have a set I have a set uh, 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 cut and paste that I put when anybody asks me for 3M, I say I don't think I'd really look good in prison orange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so one one exactly. last one we will take guys, which is if LCs or escrow is safe, why would a scammer claim to have millions? What do they have to gain making these claims? I think. If buyers know the game, they will be more equipped to protect themselves. And an extension of that is, do you see more fake sellers or fake buyers? Way more fake sellers, I think. Those are the people that are able to make, I mean, I, I, you know, buyers, I don't know how they're fake. They're, they might be tire kickers, but I think sometimes they work in cahoots. But let me tell you about LCs. LCs and escrows are super dangerous because they can be borrowed against. They only last for 90 days. They can cost you up to 6%. So you spend a lot of money at, you know, just go out and ask a question. If you, if you have a, a, a large following, ask a question about how many people have done 90 day LCs, never saw any goods, never were damaged except lost the fees. And I'll show you some guy in Thailand that's built like a beautiful house with a pool 
and has like a cook seven days a week now and is driving a Mercedes Benz. And he borrowed that money off your LC. So that's one. The other thing that's happening is, is that they make fake escrow accounts, right? So there's, they're fake escrow companies that you dump your money into and they just grab it. But there's an enormous amount of bank fraud opportunity when numbers start going back and forth. Proof of funds and who you are and let me get into your computer and give me your email and give me this broker's email. And they're getting into tons of people's computers. And if you don't think they can lay Trojans in there and then come back later on and grab your credit card, your banking information, all that crap. And three months from now, next thing you know, you're cleaned out. You're mistaken. These people are experts at this shit. They're ridiculously good. And they've done it on more stuff than just gloves. They've been doing it for, for a long time. So LCs can be dangerous if they're not right directly to the company. Somebody yeah. says, I'm getting to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, right. So I, I think they're ridiculously dangerous. It's not how normal importing is done. Yeah. Unless no, it's pointed I mean, to the company. No, so Doug, to add to that, like I said, I have done LCs in imports before, but you need to have a trust with the people that you're doing the LCs with. Right. And you need to understand them. You don't open LCs to strangers, complete strangers that you cannot even, they don't even have a website. They don't even have a, a good bank account information. They don't have any history and you're trying to open LCs to these people. Of course, you're taking a big risk. Sure. Yeah. Okay. But everybody will say the same thing about paying cash deposits, you know? Yeah. It's the same thing. You need to know who you're paying them to. And that's why it goes all the way back to proof of performance, somebody you trust. Look, it's risky. It's like the stock market. It's like going to a casino. And that's why I tell everybody. People will say to me, like, I, I don't want any risk. You know, well, then you don't need to be doing this. I want to inspect the gloves when they're in my place. Well, you're not. That's not going to happen for you. Yeah. So you need to not worry about gloves you can't make that happen right so sorry yeah so thank you thank you uh doug thank you reina thank you paul it's been amazing i i hope uh people will really really uh, learn from this and we are going to uh put the recording on our website as well as on youtube so you guys also should be able to share it but i think we covered a lot of ground on this panel uh, hopefully, uh, we will benefit some people and save some people some money uh, because of the content that you guys were able to provide. And thank you to all the people that attended. We had uh, uh, around 60 people off and on that attended. So it's pretty good uh, uh, attendees as well. And this topic is really, I mean, to me, it is very important that we bring this transparency to the world of sourcing. Otherwise, the future is really grim for, and, and like you said, Doug, uh, people have lost livings and people have lost families over this PPE trade, and it's not a nice thing. I mean, I have some I have some DMs in my LinkedIn that you know could bring you to tears uh, of yeah. people that have lost their companies that have you know that have lost a half a million that have lost a million dollars. Uh, it's it's really quite sad. Um, yeah. so, I mean, you and I have both stuck with a million dollars in places, so we know. <laughs> So, yeah. and, and I make a comment, Minesh. And I do have to say, I do have to say, look, all of importing is not like this. Yes. It really is. This is very, very unusual. I've been doing this for a long, long time. time. And, yes. and this, is not, this is not the nature of importing. Yeah. Uh, and, and even many, many things. And, 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 uh, and I will also tell you too, of all the countries, and I don't care what anyone says, I'll get a lot of feedback for this, but uh, you know, out of all the countries, I will still say the most trustworthy place to do business is in China. China. Agreed, hundred percent. Okay, so hi, Minish. I make what one, uh, one comment. Uh, in the beginning, I stated um, about two levels of consideration of security and in terms of business and security of the internet as such. So, to be a trusted player in confrontation of the total marketplace dealing with end customers like hospitals maybe or uh, distributors you have to have a, you have to play on solid ground so you have to be a trusted player so how to be a trusted player in the future you the customers 
want to pay what you deliver. That is a neat statement. But on the other hand, as a player in global player in the market, you have to have an image that people can trust you in terms of data security and business security. So data security is being taken by cybersecurity, umbrella functions over your whole network. Number two is, and that is now new, what we are now going to develop is a famous business intelligence facility. What does it mean? We can sense the minds of customers. We can sense the mind of potential customers and we can sense competitors. So it means we use the artificial intelligence of today to do this sensing globally. That means in other words, we, we automatically have by far much better quality of information on hand we can deal with. So that is, that is called business intelligence. And I think as a proven global player, we go for that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rena. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Thank you, guys. So good to see you and hopefully see you again soon. All right. Take Thank care. Thank you. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Thank I think you. we probably need to do some more things like this, maybe yep. different topics, but uh, really good job putting this together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.